So the next topic in text similarity is called dimensionality reduction. The motivation behind dimensionality reduction is that a document is often not about uh, many different topics, but just a relatively small number of topics, certainly smaller than the number of words that appear in it. So if we can somehow collapse some of the words into semantic categories, we may be able to find better similarity measures. For example, if we can collapse all the documents about patients, doctors, and hospitals into one place, uh, we may consider them to be semantically similar, even though they contain different words in that set. So the simpler vector approaches to similarity that we looked at so far have a few problems. In many cases, there is a problem with polysemy. That's when the similarity uh, the actual similarity between the words is smaller than what the cosine similarity would make you believe. So that includes uh, words with multiple senses such as bar, bank, jaguar, or hot. The opposite problem is uh, due to synonymy. That's when uh, the actual similarity between the words is larger than what the cosine similarity would make you believe. So the word like building is a synonym of edifice. There are different words. Therefore, they're going to appear in different contexts, but even though they're in different contexts, they have uh, the same meaning. So we want somehow to model synonyms and uh, in that case, overestimate their cosine similarity. The matrix between words and sentences in general is very sparse and it needs to be processed through dimensionality reduction so that we can find some hidden semantic dimensions in it. So let's look at some uh, examples from uh, the natural language processing literature. So the example on the left uh, gives you a multiple choice question from the TOEFL test. The, you're given a word, uh, specifically levied, and you're asked which word is most similar to it. So the choices are A, imposed, B, believed, C, requested, D, correlated. And the answer is that the most similar word to levied is imposed. So this is the kind of semantic relationships that we want to discover in text. And this is, where semant uh, this is where latent semantic analysis, the technique that we're going to introduce today, is going to help us. The same technique is also used to identify uh, similar analogies. So an example from the SAT test is you're given the pair mason to stone and you're asked which of the following five choices represents the most similar relationship as the one between a mason and a stone. So the answers are A, teacher to chalk, B, carpenter to wood, C, soldier to gun, D, photograph to camera, and E, book to word. And the correct answer here is carpenter to wood because just like a mason is a person who works stone, a carpenter is a person who works wood. All of the other analogies are different. So it turns out that uh, this problem of analogy similarity can also be resolved by dimensionality reduction techniques. And a lot of this work was actually done by uh, Peter Turney in his uh, papers from the last 10 years. So let's now consider dimensionality reduction in uh, more detail. So the purpose of this method is to look for hidden similarities in data. It's based on matrix decomposition. And I'm going to introduce it by giving an example uh, from some high school where uh, people measure the heights and the weights of the students in the school. And the scatter plot on the left shows you the different students who were measured. The x-axis represents, uh, let's say, the height and the y-axis represents the weight. Now we can uh, find the regression line that explains this data the best. It's shown in the middle with a red line that uh, appears diagonally. Now, it turns out that there is a third variable in addition to height and weight that can explain the differences in height and weight between the different students. And that is exactly what the regression line shows you. Uh, this line corresponds to the dimension of age. So it turns out that the sample of students in that high school was not students of the same age. It was students from across all different classes and age groups. So obviously the students in the lower grades were both lighter and uh, shorter than the students in the upper grades. But if we collapse each of those points on the uh, diagonal axis uh, that represents the regression line, you will see that there's actually a very nice trend. You know, students uh, who are older are both taller and heavier than younger students. So in this process, we're not losing much information. It turns out that we can replace height and weight with age, 
and gain most of the information that appears in the data set on the left. And everything that is uh, different between the two examples tells us uh, how a particular student differs from the trend. So a person who is too tall for the age or somebody who is too short for the age. So what we really did here was to reduce the dimensionality of our, of our data set from two dimensions to one dimension. So how is this done in practice? Well, let's go back to a little bit of linear algebra. We need uh, to remember how vectors and matrices work uh, in order to uh, understand dimensionality reduction. So a matrix is an n by n table of objects. In our case, uh, those objects are numbers. Each row and also each column of a matrix is a vector. Matrices of compatible dimensions, and there is a special definition of compatibility in this context. So matrices of compatible dimensions can be multiplied together. And uh, if you don't remember uh, this kind of math, you should go and uh, visit uh, some website that explains how to multiply matrices, and then come back here and try to multiply the two matrices in the example below. So on the next slide, I'm going to show you the answer. So uh, the way that matrices are multiplied is very simple. You just uh, multiply the values in the first row with the value in the first column, and then you add them up, and uh, the result goes into the cell that corresponds to the first row and the first column in the product. So uh, the first row of the product is 1 times 2 plus 2 times 1 plus 4 times minus 1, or a total of 0. The second row is 2 times 2 plus 5 times 1 plus 7 times minus 1, which is 2. And finally, 4 times 2 plus 9 times 1 plus 14 times minus 1 is equal to 3. So the product of those two matrices is the vector 0, 2, 3. Now, one other important concept of linear algebra that is related to dimensionality reduction is that of eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So an eigenvector is an implicit direction for a matrix. So if we multiply a vector v, uh, which is the eigenvector, to the right-hand side of a matrix A, we're going to obtain the same result as if we had multiplied v uh, with the lambda, which is a scalar, like an eigenvalue. In principle, the eigenvalue lambda can be any complex number, but uh, for the examples that we're going to look at, it will always be a real. So to compute the eigenvalues of a matrix, we need to use the following equation. Uh, we need to find the determinant of the matrix A minus lambda i, where i is a unit matrix of uh, the same size as the matrix A. And we want this to be a square matrix, obviously, so that we can compute the determinant, and we want to send, set this determinant to be equal to zero. So let's look at an example. If our matrix is uh, A is minus 1, 3, and then 2, 0, A minus lambda I is uh, the matrix shown uh, to the right. Uh, it's minus 1 minus lambda in the first row, followed by a 3, and then 2 and minus lambda in the second row. So if we want to compute the determinant of this matrix, we need to find the product of the forward diagonal and then subtract the value of the product of the numbers on the backwards diagonal. So that gives us a minus 1 minus lambda times minus lambda, and then the whole thing minus 3 times 2 equals to 0. If we solve this quadratic equation, uh, which is lambda plus lambda squared minus 6 equals 0, we are going to see that it has two roots, lambda 1 equals 2, and lambda 2, which is equal to minus 3. So if we pick one of those eigenvalues and replace them in the equation on the top, we're going to get a new matrix, minus 3, 3, 2, minus 2, which then has to be multiplied by the eigenvector x1, x2, and we want the result to be equal to 0. Well, if you solve this system of equations, you will find out that uh, its answer is x1 equals x2. So any two-dimensional vector where the x and y coordinates are the same would satisfy the second equation. So uh, if a matrix is square, it can be decomposed into u lambda u inverse, where u is its matrix of eigenvectors and lambda is a diagonal matrix of eigenvalues. And then you can do different transformations, which are uh, all uh, mathematically equivalent. So sigma u is uh, equal to u lambda, u inverse sigma u is equal to lambda, and sigma is equal to u lambda u inverse. 
So here's an example. If the original matrix S is equal to 2, 1, 1, 2, its uh, two eigenvalues are lambda 1 equals 1 and lambda 2 equals 3. And then if we do uh, this decomposition, we're going to get that U is equal to the matrix 1, 1, minus 1, 1. Its inverse, U minus 1, is equal to the matrix 1 half minus 1 half followed by 1 half, 1 half. And you can verify yourselves that we can indeed recover the original matrix S by multiplying U with lambda and then by U inverse. You can do this multiplication in sequence and you will obtain the original matrix S. So what happened here is that we are now able to convert the original matrix into a new space of uh, all the eigenvectors. And then each point in the original space is going to be represented as a point in this new representation. So in the case of the weight and height, we would have a new dimension that corresponds to the age and another dimension that corresponds to the deviation uh, that a certain person has uh, given their weight uh, based on the trend line defined by the age. Now, if the matrix is not square, we have to use a different technique called singular value decomposition. So why do we care about non-square matrices? Well, because in most NLP and information retrieval tasks, we have matrices of either documents and terms or words and their context features. And those matrices, uh, by definition, are not necessarily square. So we can have, for example, a vocabulary of size 1 million and a set of 10 million documents, in which case we're going to have a matrix of 1 million by 10 million, which is clearly not square. So in that case, we use another technique called singular value decomposition, uh, in which case a matrix A is represented as the product U sigma V transpose, where U is the matrix of orthogonal eigenvectors of the product A A transpose, V is the matrix of orthogonal eigenvectors of A transpose A, and the components of sigma are the eigenvalues of A transpose A. So this decomposition exists for all matrices, whether they're dense or sparse. Uh, we can uh, estimate uh, the dimensionality of the different matrices. For example, if A has five columns and three rows, then the matrix U of uh, the orthogonal eigenvectors of A, A transpose will be a five by five matrix. V, the matrix of orthogonal eigenvectors of A transpose A will have a dimensionality of three by three. Now, in MATLAB and Octave, you can use a very simple uh, function, SVD, uh, give it the matrix as input, and it will return a tuple consisting of U, S, and V, where those match exactly U, Sigma, and V in our example. Uh, let's look now at a specific example. We have a collection of seven documents and nine terms, and we can look at what terms appear in which documents. So, for example, document one, contains uh, terms 6 and 9, document 2 contains terms T1 and T2, and so on. So we can also look at this uh, posting list and represent the data in the form of a bipartite graph. A bipartite graph has two components, uh, one on the left and one on the right in this example, uh, that correspond to different types of objects. So the left-hand side or left-hand mode corresponds to the documents, the right-hand side corresponds to the terms. So we have, for example, a connection between D1 and T6 and D1 and T9, but we don't have a connection between D1 and T7. Okay, so now let's see how we can compute the singular value decomposition of an arbitrary matrix. We first represent it in row form, like the example on the left, where 1 means that a certain term appears in a certain document, and 0 means that it's absent from that document. And then we need to normalize this uh, matrix by dividing all the values by the length of the column vector that they are part of. So that means that in the first column we have two ones. Uh, therefore, uh, the length of the vector that corresponds to the first column is going to be square root of 2. So if we divide each of the values in that column by square root of 2, we're going to get 0 0.71 and 0 0.71. The second column vector has three ones, therefore its length is going to be square root of three. And if we divide one by square root of three, we're going to get 0 0.58. And you can see that uh, this is the technique that we use to compute uh, all of the other normalized values. So we have to normalize the matrix before we can compute its singular value decomposition. So once we do this, 
we can just enter uh, the matrix in MATLAB or our other favorite software and run the SVD library. And we're going to get something like this. U is going to be just a seven, uh, I'm sorry, a nine by nine matrix. V is going to be a seven by nine matrix. And then S is going to be a seven by nine matrix that corresponds to the um, spread on the different axes of uh, the data. So the first dimension here has a spread of zero, of, sorry, 1.58. That is the most important dimension in the lower dimensionality representation. Uh, the second uh, value is 1.27 and so on. So those are the singular values that appear in the sigma matrix. So one thing that we can do here is we can reconstitute the original matrix A by multiplying U by sigma and V transposed. But we can also produce a different version of A, specifically A star which is a lower dimensionality version of A by, instead of multiplying U with sigma and V transpose, we multiply U with sigma star and V transpose, where sigma star only keeps the largest uh, singular values of the original sigma ma matrix. So if you go back to the previous slide, we can essentially delete the fifth and the sixth line, the 0 0.5692 and the 0 0.1977, and maybe the 0 0.71 without losing much of the information stored in this matrix. And we can just keep the four most significant dimensions that correspond to the four largest values in sigma. So this is the rank four approximation of sigma. As you see, it has a, a few more zeros than the original matrix. And now if we multiply U with sigma four and V transpose, we're going to get a different representation of A, which is not going to be uh, what we had in the beginning, but it won't be significantly different from A. If we uh, do this further, uh, we can now compute the representations of the terms and the documents in the new semantic space. And this is done by appropriate uh, multiplications of matrices. So for example, U times S4 or S4 times V prime. So this gives us the representations of the documents and the terms respectively in the new semantic space. Now we can also take this a step further and compute the rank two approximation of the original matrix by just preserving the two largest values in the sigma matrix and 1.58 and 1.27. And then if we do the same uh, operators as before, we can compute a new value for alpha, for A, sorry, uh, which is its rank two approximation. So in the rank two approximation, we can now use uh, U multiplied by S2 to get the word, word vector representation in concept space. Now there are two concepts. And we can also uh, use S2 times V transpose to find the new concept representation of the documents. So in this case, we again have two dimensions. And now here's a slide that summarizes the entire uh, singular value decomposition uh, method. We have the documents shown uh, on the top uh, left and the terms on the top right in this new semantic space. So as you can see, there are two clusters of both documents and terms. I'm going to focus on one of them. In the bottom left area of, of the screen, you can see that T3, T7 appear near each other and D6 and D7 also appear near each other. So we essentially killed two birds with one stone. First, we found that there is some latent semantic similarity between the terms T3 and T7, and also a similar similarity between documents D6 and D7. But we also were able to achieve something that we couldn't do in the original space, and namely to find that documents 6 and 7 are similar to terms 3 and 7 in this new concept space. So uh, if you look at the uh, smallest circle in purple, you will see that D6 is the closest match to T3 and T7. And then the entire cluster of elements in this quadrant, including T3, T7, D6, D7, and T1 are also all semantically connected. And this is actually something that you can understand better if you look at the original example and specifically in its graph representation. You can see that D6, which is one of the documents that appears in the purple cluster here, is represented in fact as T3 and T7. D7 is similar to D6 because it has a lot of common terms with D6. 
And then if we continue expanding uh, this recursively, we'll see that D2 is the next most similar document followed by D4 and so on. And this is exactly the intuition that you would get by looking at the graph representation on the right. And now, uh, for those who are, have more patience, there are a few more formulas in MATLAB that allow you to see how to translate individual documents and terms to concepts. You just have to multiply either an entire column vector or an entire row vector with a singular value matrix. So now I have a question for you. If A is a document to term matrix, what are A times A transpose and A transpose times A? Let's start with A times A transpose. As you can see, uh, A times A transpose is a 9 by 9 matrix, which is not surprising given that the original matrix was 9 by 7 and we multiplied it by its transpose, which is 7 by 9, and therefore the result should be 9 by 9. Similarly, for A transpose times A, uh, we have uh, a matrix that is a 7 by 7, and again, this is not surprising because we multiplied a 7 by 9 matrix with a 9 by 7 matrix. But the dimensionalities of those two products should give you a hint as to what they mean. So it turns out that A transpose A is uh, the document to document similarity matrix. So for example, it tells you that uh, the similarity between document 1 and document 2 is 0, whereas the similarity between document 1 and document 4 is 0 0.639. If we go to the previous slide, uh, we can see that we A times A transpose is a term-to-term -term similarity matrix. So the similarity between term 1 and term 2 is 0 0.3364, the similarity between term 2 and term 3 is 0, and so on. So this is all based on the contexts in which those documents appear and the terms appear. So let's now uh, wrap up this section. Uh, we discussed a technique for dimensionality reduction called latent semantic indexing, or LSI, which uh, in some papers is called LSA, as in latent semantic analysis. This means pretty much the same thing. So dimensionality reduction is used to identify hidden or latent concepts in uh, textual spaces. And it is used for a variety of NLP tasks in information retrieval tasks, uh, including but not limited to query matching in latent space. Okay, so here now two external pointers uh, about latent semantic indexing, or if you prefer latent semantic analysis, are two of the sites that have been the most active uh, in this field, Colorado and the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. So this concludes the sections on text similarity using uh, singular value decomposition or uh, dimensionality reduction. And the next topic is going to be on text similarity using text kernels.